welcome to lecture number 3 of electrical machines so in the last two classes uh, last two lectures we discussed about the circuit electrical circuit analysis okay all these things we discussed like thevenin's theorem for maximum power transfer theorem and also we talked about the three phase network how the three phase network can be solved and we did a problem also regarding that okay from today onwards for few lectures we'll talk about the electromagnetism because this is very important in electromechanical energy conversion because uh, the principle of electrical electromechanical energy conversion is being used in almost all rotating machines except uh, the transformer because transformer doesn't uh, because it's not a rotating machine right so but it follow it also uses the principle of electromagnetism so we'll talk about in detail all the machines okay so let us talk about the electromagnetism in this lecture so So let us first talk about the magnetic materials and their properties because this magnetic material plays very important re- role in construction of electrical machines. So you can see here this is one of a material which is owned uh, on which the windings are owned like few windings are owned and the electric current is being injected in that winding. So here we can see the winding is not visible here in fact this is the cross section of winding if we'll see right so and one side is your cross i can say cross it and other side is dot so one side is current entering and other side current coming out so this will in fact create a magnetic uh, field right and the strength of the magnetic field if we'll see it will be concentrated inside the coil <clears throat> because it it needs in fact high permeability to have maximum uh, magnetic density right flux density but if we'll see the outside area in the air let us say air outside this solenoid so in the air we will have very less strength of the magnetic flux so why it is so we'll talk about uh, more detail in it and we can see the if we'll plot the magnetic flux density versus the length right if we'll see the length uh, of this solenoid right or toroid so if we'll plot this we can find at the middle in fact here at the middle of the solenoid we'll find the magnetic flux density is maximum right bm and at the end towards the end it is gradually it is decreasing and finally it will decrease to zero right so up to the at the end of the two lines we can see that the magnetic strength or magnetic uh, density is decreasing gradually right okay so this is how the solenoid works and let us talk about the materials magnetic materials so we have heard all these materials in our 10th 11th or 12th class physics already right so just review so diamagnetic material <laughs> what is diamagnetic material those substances that experience a feeble force of repulsion are called diamagnetic material okay so when it is in fact the material is brought towards the solenoid right so it will it will feel it will experience a feeble force of refle- repulsion right that that is called the diamagnetic material and the permeability of this kind of material is slightly less than the permeability of the free space so permeability of the free space we know right the relative permeability is 1 and obviously the <coughs> the mu not we know it is 4 5 into 10 to the power minus 7 Uh, henry per meter something like this right so this is uh, the permeability of the free space and in fact if we'll see the relative permeability of these diamagnetic material these are examples of some diamagnetic material bismuth 
beryllium, copper, methane, silver, water. And you will see the relative permeability it is approximately equal to one, which is in fact, which is if we see the, the relative permeability of the free space is also, it is one, right? And it is approximately close to one, right? But slightly less than one. So therefore it is mentioned that it is slightly less than the uh, permeability of the free space, okay? <clears throat> now I'll talk about the paramagnetic material. <clears throat> So these are the materials that are pulled towards the center of the solenoid because we know in the center of the solenoid, the magnetic flux density or the strength of the magnetic field is the highest. So it is pulled towards the center of the solenoid with a feeble force and are called paramagnetic material. So these substances exhibit slightly greater permeabilities than that of the free space. Slightly greater, like in case of Diamagnetic, it is slightly lesser than the free space permeability, but here the paramagnetic material has the permeability which is slightly greater than the free space. Since the force experienced by the paramagnetic or the diamagnetic substance is quite feeble, it is very less, right? As it is because it is equivalent to the free space. So for all practical purposes, we can group them together and therefore they can be referred as non-magnetic materials, okay? And it is common practice to assume that the permeability of all non-magnetic materials is same as that of free space. So it is assumed when we do any practical uh, work or practical design or any kind of work during solving the problems also we'll see, we'll assume that non-magnetic material means the permeability is assumed to be same as the free space. These materials are of no practical use in construction of magnetic circuits because the permeability is very less, right? Therefore, it is not used in the design of magnetic circuits or it, it is also not used for a design of magnet electromechanical machines, right? Like your rotating machines. So there are a few examples of uh, paramagnetic material. We can see here the examples are air, aluminum, oxygen, manganese, and palladium, platinum. And the relative permeability is given, which is slightly greater than the free space, right? The perme relative permeability of free space is one. So here the paramagnetic material, it is slightly greater than the a free space, okay? So similarly, if we'll see the ferromagnetic material, this is this is very important material for our electrical machines design or construction, right? The magnetic force of attraction experienced by a ferromagnetic material may be 5,000 times that experienced by the paramagnetic material. 5,000 times x greater, that means your relative permeability for ferromagnetic material is around 5,000, okay? It is very high and therefore the flux density or uh, the, the passing of the flux in the mag ferromagnetic material is very, very high and without any resistance. So here we can use the theory of magnetic domains containing magnetic dipoles to explain the ferromagnetic magnetism. In fact, in modern physics, this is this can be explained in the using the quantum theory as well, but we'll not go into detail, but only we'll talk about the magnetic domains and what is required for our uh, course of understanding, right? So uh, we, we'll use the theory of magnetic domains uh, to explain this uh, ferromagnetism, ferromagnetism principle. So what is then magnetic domain? In fact, a magnetic domain is consisting of magnetic dipoles, okay? So there are very many magnetic dipoles together in one direction. They consist, they constitute the magnetic domain. So what is this magnetic dipole? So the net magnetic moment of the atom is obtained. If we will calculate the net magnetic moment of an atom, we can combine the orbital and the spin moments of an electron, right? And by taking into account the directions as well, those moments are calculated and that is known as the magnetic moment. And that in fact decides the magnetic dipoles, right? 
so it is in fact in a particular direction so this moment is in a particular direction and we call it magnetic dipoles okay. so there are various magnetic dipoles in, in in a single direction they will be grouped together and they will form the magnetic domain okay domain so we'll see we can see the picture here so this the behavior of ferromagnetic materials such as iron cobalt and nickel can be easily explained in terms of magnetic domains so you can see here <coughs> the each section here <coughs> each section can be called as magnetic domains because inside each domain we can see the dipoles magnetic dipoles in in a single direction right so here the magnetic dipoles are in one direction here in one direction right so therefore each of the group of these dipoles they form the domains magnetic domains so we'll find in a ferromagnetic material many domains like this magnetic domains we'll find there so a magnetic domain is a very small region in which all the magnetic dipoles are perfectly aligned the direction of alignment of the magnetic dipoles varies from one domain to next right so direction may not be equal there may be opposite they may be randomly randomly random directions right owing to these random alignments a virgin material is in a non magnetized state so therefore because if all the dipoles all the domains are in the single direction then it will form a magnetized state if it is in different direction they counteract each other so the magnetic dipoles if all these magnetic dipoles are in the single direction let us say here in this direction then it will form it will the mag, the material will become a magnet it will be magnetized right so because the dipoles are in random random directions they have any directions and therefore they counteract each other right so therefore it remains in non magnetized state okay when the magnetic material is placed in an external magnetic field all the dipoles tend to align along the magnetic field okay so when we take this ferromagnetic material to an external magnetic field all the dipoles tend to align along the magnetic field one way to place the magnetic material in the magnetic field is the to wind a current carrying wire around it so if we'll put a current carrying conductor on a ferromagnetic material obviously it will be in the magnetic field external magnetic field right <clears throat> so we can expect that some domains in the magnetic material were already more or less aligned in the direction of the field and so therefore what happens we can see here <coughs> when suppose this material is being owned right with a current carrying conductor and the magnetic field will force all these domains to align in the direction of the magnetic field so if the magnetic field is in this direction right let us say this is the magnetic field direction now all the domains all the dipoles in each of the domain will align along with the magnetic field because the magnetic field is having higher strength as compared to each of the dipoles so therefore these dipoles will be aligned in the direction of the magnetic field so now you can see here there is a, a solenoid or you can see it toroid whatever it is a rectangular toroid where there is a current carrying conductor around this and it it is producing a magnetic field of h here h and b is the magnetic flux density and the current flown in this is i right so the magnetic field strength will depend upon the current in the uh, winding right so if we'll increase the current here let us say this current i am increasing so now if i'll increase this current then obviously the magnetic strength will increase now if i'll plot the magnetic flux density b b versus h that is for field intensity so field int intensity is directly proportional to the current so therefore as i increase the current 
the magnetic field intensity will increase and hence your the dipoles will align with the uh, with the magnetic field and gradually a point will be achieved here we call it knee point at this point the flux density will not increase more it will gradually the the curve will become flattened we call it saturated region what what why it is called saturated region because there is no more dipoles or mo no more electric magnetic domains which needs to be aligned in the direction of the magnetic field that means at the knee point we achieved all the magnetic domains which are aligned in the magnetic field direction right so that means all the domains we achieved at the knee point they are aligned in the direction of the magnetic field so there is no further there are no further magnetic domains which need to be aligned in the direction of the magnetic field therefore we get a saturated curve and therefore the flux density will not increase further it will gradually become saturated right okay at this point so <clears throat> this is called <clears throat> this is a called phenomenon of saturation when all the magnetic domains they align with the magnetic field <clears throat> okay so now we'll talk about the permeability of the silicon steel as a function of flux density in fact permeability is a function of uh, flux density we can say when the fall flux density is getting saturated the permeability will decrease gradually right <coughs> we can see here <coughs> the the characteristic plotted it maybe it is experimental characteristic it is plotted we can see here the permeability versus the flux density if we plot it we'll see gradually when the flux density will increase and up to this point maybe near to the 0.5 tesla right to this point near to 0.5 tesla right if we'll mark it here near to 0.5 tesla flux density your relative permeability is increasing and after that your relative permeability of the material is decreasing gradually right as we increase the even the flux density is being increased the relative permeability is decreasing right so that means your the permeability is a function of this flux density we can see right but it is a nonlinear function it is not a straightforward function of flux density so this is how this in fact plays very important role in the hysteresis loop already you might have studied in your 12th class right if we'll take a solenoid here right experimentally also we can take this hysteresis loop if we put an current source here across the uh, across this winding we may call it primary winding and there is another winding we call it secondary winding and obviously the voltage if we'll measure across this right this voltage will be directly proportional to the flux density okay b so sorry you can write it here directly proportional to b and as we increase the current the magnetic in uh, magnetic field will increase gradually and we can measure voltage and current if we we'll plot it this will give us if we we'll, i'll plot voltage versus current injected input current and output voltage right so that will give me in fact voltage is directly proportional to flux density and current here is direct the h is directly proportional to current rate so this in fact give us the bh curve that means the curve between flux density and the magnetic field h right so if it is plotted what happens <laughs> we can see from this characteristic right so very nicely we can observe this what happens when we increase the field here is h is increased right so now if the h will increase it will gradually the curve will increase and after such such some time it will get saturated right let us say this point is vm where the flux density is getting saturated and then if we'll decrease the 
current here, right? It will decrease the current gradually, okay, in steps. When the current will be increased in continuous mode, then we'll see that the flux density will follow a different path. It will not follow the path by which it achieved the saturation. So this phenomena, why it happens? Because when we reverse the current, few of the magnetic domain, they remain aligned, right? They don't come back to its original state. So therefore, even if we are making the f making the field here zero, H is zero, but still we see that the flux density doesn't become zero. It has certain value. And we call this value as a residual magnetic flux, max residual magnetic flux density. That BR indicates the residual flux density in the in the magnetic material, right? So therefore, in order to again bring the magnetic flux density to zero, we need to again give the current in the opposite direction, right? So we are gradually decrease the current to zero. But here again, because we have the magnetic flux density, residual magnetic flux density, we need to again give it in the reverse direction. That means negative current in order to bring this flux density to zero. So therefore, we can see here at minus HSC, your B is becoming zero here, right? So therefore, this HS, H, HC, that HC, we call it coercive force, okay? Coercive force. So we can see here, one is your residue magnetic field, that is V, right? Another one is your coercive force, right? So by the coercive force, we force the magnetic flux in this core or in this magnetic material to become zero. So again, if we'll decrease the further, we'll decrease the magnetic fold, uh, magnetic intensity, then gradually again, it will go uh, negative to negative direction, right? The flux will flow in the negative direction up to this, up to the saturation point in the negative direction that is minus Vm. And again, if we'll reverse, again, it will follow a different path. It will not follow the same path, right? By which it gets saturated, it will follow a different path and again, it will achieve. So this cycle will continue. If we'll connect a AC source or AC current here, in fact, this will give this kind of cycle. So this will vary. The flux density inside this magnetic material will vary like it will increase and it will it will form a loop and we call this loop as hysteresis loop right this is known as the hysteresis loop okay therefore this is called the hysteresis loop and when in fact the magnetic material gets saturated and when the residual if the magnetic material is hard that means it is hard magnetic material. The residual magnetic flux will be more when we bring back the current to zero or the magnetic field intensity to zero. That means even if we are removing the supply from it, the magnetism in the material remains. And, we, and then that becomes a magnet now, right? So that kind of material, we call it hard material, okay? So that therefore, the, for hard material, if we we'll plot the this hysteresis loop, it in fact it is very flattened, right? If we we'll plot B and H for hard material, it will look like this. It will increase gradually, and it will come like this. Very. It will be a flattened curve, right? It is like this. Okay, so it will be more flattened and it will have more area in the hysteresis slope. So this is for hard material, right? Similarly, opposite to this is hard magnetic material. Opposite to this is the soft magnetic material. For soft magnetic material, in fact, this hysteresis slope becomes very thinner and thinner because the residual magnetism is very less in case of soft magnetic material. Okay, so that means for soft magnetic material, if we'll plot this, 
a stress slope it will be very very thinner right it will be like this this is for soft magnetic material okay so this is called hysteresis loop now we'll talk about the magnetic circuit what is this magnetic circuit in fact we have studied electric circuit but what is this magnetic circuit in fact in the electric circuit the 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 quantity that flows in the electric circuit is the current right and and to the current we if we apply the ohm's law it gives us a very simple ohm's law it gives us v equal to ir that means the current is flowing in the circuit a simple circuit if i plot here right very simple circuit then the current flowing through this is i and i can write v equal to ir and r is the resistance of the circuit right that means resistance of this conductor and current is flowing through the circuit that means resistance is a phenomena which resists the flow of current right so therefore we call it resistance okay so this is the basics of electric circuit now similarly we can have also the magnetic circuits with certain assumptions so let us talk about this magnetic circuits and what are the assumptions in it okay let us see so since you will see since the magnetic flux lines form a closed path right if we will put a solenoid right as we have seen in the last here right this is a closed path for the magnetic flux right the flux is flowing through this uh, toroid right and it is for forming a closed path right so that is what here it is mentioned that uh, form a closed path and the magnetic flux entering a boundary is the same as the magnetic flux leaving a boundary we can draw an analogy between the magnetic flux and the current in the closed conducting circuit right so in a conducting circuit the current flows exclusively through the conductor without any leakage so this is the difference in fact in a electric circuit and the magnetic circuit in the magnetic circuit the flux flows and in the electric circuit the current flows but in the electric circuit there is no leakage of the current but in case of magnetic circuit there is a leakage of flux in the surrounding medium right <clears throat> so on the other hand the magnetic flux cannot be completely confined to follow a given path in the magnetic material so however if the permeability of the magnetic material is very high like ferromagnetic material compared with that of the material surrounding it that means if i put a ferromagnetic material and around the ferromagnetic material i put the i wind some coil and i am injecting some current to the coil and it will produce the magnetic flux and if it is put inside the air right air is the medium in which the this solenoid is put the flux produced in because of this will be most of the flux will be confined to the highly permeable material right because this ferromagnetic material is the magnetic Uh, permeability is very high relative permeability around 5000 and whereas the air has the relative permeability of 1 right so it is very less and therefore most of the flux will be confined to this highly permeable material rather than passing to the air okay but some leakage will be there and it is very negligible we can say it is very very negligible okay so this leads to the concentration of magnetic flux within the magnetic material with almost negligible flux in the region surrounding it the channeling of the flux through the highly permeable material is very similar to the current flow through a conductor this is very very similar to the current flow in a conductor because we are neglecting the leakage of the flux this is the assumption in case of a highly permeable material highly highly permeable material which which permeability is very high then we can say that it is for, it is 
exactly like the current passing in a conductor, right? So for this region, we call the path followed by the flux in a magnetic material, a magnetic circuit. So magnetic circuits form an integral part of such devices of ro as rotating machines, transformers, right, and electromagnets, and also relays, because these relays are electromechanical relays, in fact. Nowadays, these relays are obsolete because nowadays the numerical relays came into picture. So we can see here a solenoid or a toroid here because it's a closed straight. And you will see the this is a circular structure, right? And the cross section of this toroid is given, which is a square shaped, a rectangular shaped, right? And the uh, inner radius of this toroid is A and the outer radius is B, right? Here we can see A and B. And the toroid is being owned by a coil and the coil is injected through a current source, that is I, we are injecting a current I, right? And the height of the toroid is H, okay? So now, for this toroid, if I'll apply the Ampere's law, so everybody uh, um, must have started in the 12th. What is Ampere's law? Ampere's law states that it is H dot DL circuital. Okay, it is the integral of H. It is equal to the I. That means if we'll consider a single conductor for this, right? Let us say this is a single conductor, right? and the conductor is carrying a current of I, because of this conductor, there will be flux around this conductor, right? Circular flux. So this circular flux will, let us say, in this, because it will be in this direction as for the right-hand rule. And if we we'll apply the Ampere's law here for this case, it will be HDL, uh, integral of HDL equal to the current enclosed by the magnetic flux, right? So that means magnetic flux, flux uh, intensity into L. That means L means the path covered by the flux, that is the L, right? And the current in I is the current enclosed by the flux, right? So similarly, if we we'll apply this principle here to this toroid, we can see here, so the flux is passing here in this direction. It is through a closed path, right? And the field, in fact, say we can say it's, right? And the current enclosed by this flux is how much? The current enclosed by this flux is, because we have n number of turns in this coil, so the current enclosed, net current enclosed in this by this flux is Ni, right? Okay. So therefore I can write, if I'll write this using the Ampere's law, I can write H will be equal to Ni by 2 pi R because if I take the integration, the length of the flux will be 2 pi R, right? Let us say R is the minimum, uh, medium, sorry, sorry. It is the main radius, right? Main radius of this toroid from the center. Okay. So H into 2 pi R will be Ni, right? And that will give me H equal to Ni by 2 pi R. Okay. So this is what it is mentioned here. And <clears throat> from this equation, so your B phi, that is flux density, will become mu into H phi, that is nothing but equal to mu into Ni by 2 pi R. And if I'll find phi flux from here, flux equation, that is flux will be nothing but, because we know flux is uh, equal to BA. So I can write the integral of B with respect to the area, DS, right? So here the area is, is rectangular area, that is, uh, one side it is B minus A, right? Because if we'll see the lengthwise, it is B in the in the direction of radius, it is B minus A, and in the height is H. So therefore I can integrate 
b dot s okay so now if i'll further expand this i can substitute b is equal to mu ni by 2 pi and if we'll take the integration in the direction of radius it is from a to b right so 1 by r dr right so obviously because 2 pi r is here is we took r right 1 by r r dr and in the direction of height if we'll take the integration it is 0 to h dz right so now after taking the integration if we'll find so it is mu ni by 2 pi So obviously 0 to h dz will be h, and if we'll take integration of 1 by r dr, it is ln of r, so natural logarithm of r, and ln of b by a it will become right. So therefore your flux becomes mu ni by 2 pi h ln b by a. Okay. Now when the toroidal core is made of a very highly permeable magnetic material and the winding is concentrated over only a small portion of the toroid so here the winding is spread through the toroid so it is assumed that there is very neglecting negligible um, leakage flux right because the whole toroid is being owned by the winding but if suppose we have a toroid where <coughs> the coil is having put in the small portion right with a highly permeable magnetic material and the winding is concentrated over only a small portion of the toroid a large portion of the magnetic flux still circulates through the core right we can see the example here so a fraction of the total flux produced by the coil does complete its path through the medium surrounding the magnetic circuit and is referred to as a leakage flux so we can see here this is the uh, toroid where in a small portion the winding is owned right and because of this if the magnetic material is highly permeable then the flux will be a con uh, enclosed inside the magnetic material and there will be very less leakage flux like like here it is mentioned right very very less leakage flux in the coil right and when if there is some air gap in the toroid suppose there is a small air gap not very large if the small air gap air, there is there the cross section in this the cross section in this air gap will be assumed it is equal to the cross section of the magnetic material because there will be fringing effect because of the fringing effect the cross section may increase if the air gap is very large but here the air gap is very small therefore the fringing effect is neglected this is fringing effect right so the fringing effect in fact enlarges the cross sectional area if suppose the air gap is large here right this much then obviously the fringing the flux will pass like this right very it will it will cover large area right so therefore the cross sectional area will increase so but when the cross the the air gap is very small like in case of rotating electrical machines we'll talk about this in the future classes so in those cases the rotate the air gap is very small so therefore the fringing effect is neglected here right <clears throat> so in the design of magnetic circuits an attempt is always made to keep the leakage flux as small as economically possible so therefore it is very important the air gap is kept very small <clears throat> okay sorry the leakage flux is also made very small consequently in the analysis of magnetic circuits we disregard the leakage flux so in the further analysis of uh, this magnetic circuit will disregard this leakage flux so in case in the case of a toroid we find that the magnetic field intensity and thereby the magnetic flux density are inversely proportional to the radius of the circular path already we have seen in this expression right so magnetic flux density is inversely proportional to the radius of the of the toroid right that means it indicates that the magnetic flux density is higher in the inner side of the toroid right so this indicates in other words the magnetic flux density is maximum at the inner radius of the toroid and minimum at the outer radius 
So in the analysis of magnetic circuits, we usually assume that the magnetic flux density is uniform within the magnetic material. So this is an assumption here we are taking in order to analyze the magnetic circuits. So this assumption is that the magnetic flux density is assumed as uniform throughout the cross section of the toroid. Whereas from the expression, it is very clear that <coughs> your magnetic flux density is very high towards the inner side of the toroid, right? And towards, if we move towards the out, outer side, the magnetic flux density is decreasing, right? And its magnitude is equal to the magnetic flux density at the mean radius. So it, it is the assumption we'll take during the analysis of magnetic circuits. So the toroid forms a continuous closed path for the magnetic circuit. However, in applications such as rotating machines, the closed path is often broken by air gaps. That is what we discussed in the last slide, that if the air gap is very small, then we can assume that the area of cross-section in the air gap is also equal to the area of cross-section of the core or of the magnetic material, right? <clears throat> so the magnetic circuit now consists of a highly permeable magnetic material in series with the air gap, right? Since it is in series circuit, so the magnetic flux in the magnetic material is equal to the magnetic flux in the air gap. <laughs> like in case of <laughs> electric circuit also, we are having different resistances and we combine it in series because the current in the series circuit remains same. So similarly in the magnetic circuit also, if we have different medium, <clears throat> right, or we have different magnetic material or we have some air gap, right, so that will in fact gives us the analogy of series circuit, so series magnetic circuit, right? So then, therefore, the magnetic flux will remain constant throughout and with different resistances that in the magnetic circuit, we call it reluctances, right? In case of electric circuit, we call it resistance, right? So the spreading of the magnetic flux in the air gap known as fringing, as I explained in the previous slide, is inevitable as shown in the figure. However, if the length of the air gap is very small compared with, the, with, the, with its other dimensions, right? Most of the flux lines are well confined between the opposite surfaces of the magnetic core at the air gap and the fringing effect will be negligible. So if this is very small and it is negligible compared to the other dimensions like the core height and length, <clears throat> then obviously we can <clears throat> neglect this fringing effect. Thus, in the analysis of the magnetic circuits, we usually make the following assumptions. These three assumptions we can take. The magnetic flux is restricted to flow through the magnetic material. That means there is no leakage. This is one assumption. And second assumption is there is no spreading of or fringing of the magnetic flux in the air gap. And third assumption is magnetic flux density is uniform within the magnetic material. Those these these are not perfect in case of a, in practical case in the magnetic materials, but still these assumptions we will have to take during the analysis of the magnetic circuits. Okay, <coughs> so <coughs> let us uh, consider this. If we'll write <coughs> the, here we'll consider a toroid, right? Rectangular toroid over whom which the the coil is being owned and the current injected is I, right? So now if we'll apply the ampere circuital law, so SDL I can write, integration of SDL I can write the current enclosed. So current enclosed in this flux path is Ni, right? So number of trons in the coil is let us say N. So Ni is the, num uh, the net current enclosed. So this Ni is represented through F and it is known as MMF, that is magnetomotive force, right? And I can write it now H into L. L, let us say L is the length of this uh, core, right? In in the in the perimeter, perimeter length of the core, H L. 
So now HL I can write equal to NI <clears throat> and that is from here I can find B equal to mu H. So that, that is nothing but B equal to mu NI by L. Okay. And from here I can find phi also. So that is flux passing through this toroid, right? So I can write phi equal to integration of B with respect to DS. So here the cross-sectional area is A, right? Let us say A is the cross-sectional area of this toroid. This is a rectangular cross-section, right? So B into A, just substituting the expression of B, that is mu Ni by L. So I can write phi equal to mu Ni A by L, right? And this gives us phi equal to, I can write it as Ni by L by mu a, right? So that means Ni is your F, that is the MMF, magnetomotive force, MMF, and L by mu <coughs> A, I can write, represent through R, that is <coughs> the reluctance, <coughs> okay? <coughs> like in case of electric circuit, we know the resistance, the formula of resistance is, what is the formula? That is L, uh, L rho by A, right? Okay. So rho is the conductivity uh, of the circuit, right? Similarly here, in case of uh, phi, in case of magnetic circuit, we have permeability, right? Mu, okay. So conductivity is equivalent to the permeability uh, in case of uh, magnetic circuit. So MMF by R, right? Now if we we'll represent this, in terms of a circuit, right? So I can say this circuit will be for, will be uh, having a forcing function or forcing uh, element that is F, like in case of electric circuit, we have EMF. Here in the magnetic circuit, we call it magnetomotive force, MMF, and that is equal to Ni. And the flux is passing, and the flux is equivalent to current here, right? In case of electric circuit, we take current as the as circulating element, which is circulating through the circuit. So here the flux is circulating. So here the flux is equivalent to the current, right? And now in case of uh, uh, electric circuit, it is the resistance. And here in the magnetic circuit, it is the reluctance. And that is represented by L by mu A, right? Okay. You can see here, sorry, this is the rho is below. Huh? There is L uh, rho, L sigma by A. Huh? Sigma is the conductivity. Conductivity of the conductor. Conductivity of the conductor. And here the mu is your permeability of the material, ferromagnetic material. Now this magnetic circuit, this, this toroid can be represented through a magnetic circuit with MMF that is equal to Ni and having reluctance that is equal to L by mu A and the flux passing through this is phi, right? So now I can write phi R equal to Ni like in case of electric circuit also we write right? V equal to uh, IR so here, opposite, I can write it, I R equal to V, right? So this here, the analogy if we'll make, I is equivalent to phi, and R is equivalent to the reluctance, and V is equivalent to the Ni, that is MMF. Okay. So like this, we can do the analysis for this circuit also. You can see here, this circuit is having different flux passing through. This is a kind of, we can say, the circuit, uh, magnetic circuit, where the net flux, the, the, the coil is here in the middle limb, right? And the net flux is divided into two parts. One is phi one and phi two. And the permeability of, let us say, the permeability is same for all the uh, circuits. Now, if I'll represent this in, in, in the magnetic circuit form, I can write it as, here is your MMF. This is represented through this coil, right? That is Ni. And the resistance 
here the reluctance is RBC. The limb of BC is represented through RBC. And here it is also, sorry, RB, right? And it is RBC, right? Similarly, the other limbs are represented through different reluctances, RAB, RAF, REF, RD, RCD, right? And the flux, net flux reduced by the MMF is phi, and it is segregated into two parts, phi1 and phi2, which is flowing here. And again, it is coming back and added up to, and it gives again phi, right? It is exactly like the electric circuit, what we have discussed previously also, right? So this is called the magnetic circuit analysis. So like in case of electric circuit, we apply the KVL, right? So that means the net uh, voltage across the loop is equal to the net EMF, right? Similarly, here also we can apply KVL, that is sum of HI LI from I to N. If we have N number of loops, that is will be equal to NI. NI is the net MMF produced, right? Net MMF produced by the coil, okay? So this is what exactly we can have. We, that this is called the uh, uh, KVL is Kirchhoff's voltage law. Here we call the Kirchhoff's MMF law, right? So Kirchhoff's MMF law. Kirchhoff's MMF law. Okay. So now uh, it appears that a magnetic circuit can always be analyzed using an equivalent reluctant circuit. However, it is this is true only for a linear magnetic circuit. A magnetic circuit is linear if the permeability of each magnetic section is constant. That means the permeability will not change with time. As, as I have told that the ferromagnetic materials, the flux in fact, what happens, the flux density is a function of, uh, sorry, does the, the reluctance is a function of the, the permeability is a function of the flux, dens uh, flux density. As the flux density will increase, the permeability will change after a certain uh, time. And when the permeability will change, the reluctance will also change. That means it is not linear circuit, linear in fact, in practice, but in order for the assumption, we take that this is linear. That means your permeability is varying linearly with the flux density, okay? So for a ferromagnetic material, the permeability is a function of the magnetic flux density as explained. When the permeability of a magnetic material varies with the flux density, the magnetic circuit is said to be nonlinear. So as I discussed this, so all devices using ferromagnetic materials such as iron form nonlinear magnetic circuits, right? Therefore, in, in the analysis purpose, we always assume that the analysis is done in, in the non-saturated region. That means when the flux is directly proportional or the, the flux density is directly proportional to H, at that region only we do analysis and therefore we can assume uh, this magnetic circuit problem as a linear or magnetic uh, uh, material as the linear. Okay, the flux density is varying linear, the, the permeability is varying linearly with flux density. Okay, <clears throat> so in the magnetic circuit problem, basically there are two types of problems pertaining to the analysis of magnetic circuit, right? So the first type requires the determination of the applied MMF to establish a given flux density in the magnetic circuit. This is first type of problem. And the other problem deals with the calculation of the magnetic flux density and thereby the flux in the magnetic circuit when the applied MMF is given, right? It is similar to the electric circuit. Sometime we ask to find the uh, EMF if the current is given and sometime we need to find the current when the EMF is given, the same problem. So for a linear magnetic circuit, the solution to either problem can be obtained using the equivalent reluctant circuit. So for linear circuit, there is no problem at all. We use this, the same principle as electric circuits. So KVL, KCL, everything is applicable here in case of magnetic circuit. If we are taking assumption that 
the magnetic L, L, magnetic material is linear, right? So in the nonlinear magnetic circuit, it is relatively simple and straightforward to determine the required MMF to maintain a certain flux density in the magnetic circuit. It is also possible to find in case of nonlinear magnetic circuit with little uh, complexity. In this case, we calculate the flux density in each magnetic section. First, we calculate the flux density, then obtain H from the BH curve. So after finding B, because BH curve is not linear, so it is like this somehow. So if we find B somewhere here in this region, then corresponding H we can calculate, right? This is H and B. So if we can calculate the flux density, then the corresponding H we can find from the BH curve. And this BH curve is obtained experimentally, right? It is not theoretically, we cannot obtain this. Experimentally, we obtain this BH curve. And from there, we find the H value. And then after that, uh, by knowing H, we can determine the MMF drops across each magnetic section. The required MMF is simply the sum of the individual MMF drops. So it is very simply we can find it out, right? So the second type of problem in nonlinear circuit may be solved using iterative techniques. Also, some iterative techniques can be used to solve this. So we are, we are not going to discuss this, okay? So this is a problem. You can take it and you can solve it. And in the next class, we'll discuss this problem. So there is an electromagnet of square cross section. Uh, cross -section uh, the cross section is square size, right? And here the cross section is square. Huh? It is square. And it is having tightly wound coil with 1500 tons. The inner and the outer radii of the mag magnetic core are 10 centimeter and 12 centimeter respectively. The length of the air gap is one centimeter here. The length of the air gap is one centimeter. If the current in the coil is four ampere, here the current is equal to four ampere, and the relative permeability of the magnetic material is 1200. So mu R is 1200. Determine the flux density in the magnetic circuit. So here the MMF is given, right? MMF you can find, MMF is 1500 into four, right? And you need to find the flux density in the magnetic circuit. So please do this. Next class we'll discuss because this uh, will take little time and you're, you, you may have the next class scheduled. So we'll stop here, okay? So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much.